next speaker is David Denherring from Atronix, and he's going to tell us all about how they use Rebel. At the risk of digressing on my very first slide, I'd like to point out uh, that I have all capped Rebel. And I, <laughs> and I know that there's been a uh, community discussion, I guess, about not doing that anymore, proper casing it. Um, I guess call me old fashioned, I like it that way. I think the all cap stands out on the page. I think for somebody who's never seen the word before, it kind of in, in this form anyway, they say, oh, it's an acronym. You know, maybe I should look that up and learn a little bit more about it. So that's my two cents on it. And uh, my digression on slide one is finished. So before I uh, get into Escada, our software product, I want to tell you a little bit about Atronix. So Atronix Engineering is a system integrator. Um, our two primary industries is material handling and automotive. Um, basically, we do industrial type control systems and all the software that surrounds that. So we, we control things in the real world. Uh, we were founded in 1992. We're privately held. We have three owners. Now we have about 35 engineers um, in, in the Atlanta office, about 15 in, in our north office. So 50 engineers overall. Now, out of those 50 engineers, we have um, seven Rebel developers. Uh, so, and they're working hard every day, putting out Rebel code, uh, cu doing customizations on projects and, and things like that. Five of those are, are working on production projects. The other two are currently in, kind of in a training mode right now. So, you know, we're slowly expanding the company. Uh, when we need a new guy to work on Rebel, you know, we look for candidates that have a background in um, shell scripting or Perl or Python, anybody with some scripting experience and kind of an open mind on, on tool sets like that, those are the candidates we look for and, and really we don't have too much trouble getting them up to speed in Rebel. So what is a systems integrator? Here you have the, uh, the Wikipedia definition of it. When I read it, it just it, it sounds kind of uh, boring and unchallenging to me, but that really is not the nature of our job. It's, it's very interesting work. Um, we're always having to deal with new equipment, uh, integrate new equipment into our what, you know, what is our base system. I've been with the company for 11 years, so still, still not tired of it. Now, our, our software product is called Escada, and what that means is Atronic SCADA. I don't know if you've heard that term before, but um, you know, in our area of the country, we would call that SCADA or SCADA. Um, but uh, despite the fact that we came up with it in Georgia, we have a European pronunciation. But what, what is SCADA? Um, it really, it is just software that interfaces to real-time equipment. Here, here's, the again, the Wikipedia definition of it. What we use uh, Rebel for is interfacing to pieces of equipment such as print and applies, uh, way scales, um, the customer's uh, warehouse management systems, and it might be SAP or JD Edwards or something more specific than that. This Escada is not a commercial product. Really what Escada is for us is it's, it's an internal platform that we use for building systems for our customer. And this gives you a little bit of idea of the architecture of Escada. Um, green is our part of the system, blue is the customer system. But at the, at the very base of this, at the, at the lowest level, we have the customer's machinery. And right above that, we have um, PLCs, which are programmable logic controllers. They're special purpose industrial computers uh, for doing real-time control. Um, they have their own proprietary programming languages such as Ladder Logic. They've been around since the 1970s. They started in the U.S. auto industry back in the late 70s, I believe. Modicon was one of the first providers. So our system, Escada, actually is a, a one level above that, and it communicates with the PLCs, but the PLCs are actually what's controlling the machine. And we also have at the, about that same level is our, our database. We do all the data logging there. Everything about the system is, is stored there. And then above that, we have a SCADA services. Now, those services, um, we, we've got it pretty much segmented to where one service does a particular task, um, which could include traditional things like alarming, data logging, um, high-speed sortation, you know, reading weights from a weigh scale as packages move down a conveyor. We've done larger, we've done smaller, but anywhere from about 10 to 50 Rebel services running on, a, on an individual server is, is pretty typical. In addition to that, we have an HMI, a human machine interface. That's the user interface that the, uh, the customer sees. We have a WMS, a warehouse management system. That could be SAP, JD Edwards, Red Prairie, Manhattan. 
uh, different different types of systems and and different ways of communicating. Uh, sometimes we do uh, proprietary socket protocols, so we do a lot of uh, protocol development. Uh, sometimes it's just simple file sharing, database table sharing. So we've been deploying Escada systems since about 2000, 2001, and we weren't always a rebel shop. So we first started out with uh, VB6, not, not an uncommon choice uh, coming out of the 1990s, and a lot of our engineers at the time were very comfortable with it. So, And if you know anything about SCADA, there, there's a lot of other packages, commercial packages out there that you can use, like Wonderware, RSView, Factory Link. Um, and before this time, that's what we used. Um, but we found out that for smaller jobs and for certain customers, we weren't able to compete well against our competitors because the, um, we were all kind of on a level playing field. We all had to buy basically the same software. Um, we were all in the same boat. And you know, a development license for Wonderware, for example, um, is about $12,000. A runtime deployment is about $5,000. So if you have, if you need a development license and five workstations out on your system, you know, that's, that, that money adds up pretty quickly. Ended up having to buy Wonderware or some other SCADA type product, plus have to do our own middleware. So we thought, well, why don't we just go ahead and take it the whole way? We're just going to go ahead and add these extra functions and just deploy our own SCADA product. That gave us the ability to save all those licensing fees and uh, outbid or underbid our, our competitors. And we deployed several systems that way. They were very successful. Um, but by 2003, you know, Microsoft started making noises about just um, sunsetting ba Visual Basic. So basically disenfranchising millions of developers. So we started looking around at, you know, where do we move from here? Do we go to .NET, which was at version 1 at the time, or do we look at Java, which was another popular option? Um, uh, so it's 2003, and we decided to, to shift over to Delphi. And for some of us, that was another comfortable move, because I know when I was in college, um, one of the first languages I learned was, was Pascal, Turbo Pascal. So Delphi is the, just the Windows version of that. And, and, so, and, and really, if, if you don't know what Delphi is, it's basically like Visual C++, but with Pascal syntax. You have to do your own memory management. So and at the time, too, web interfaces were starting to come up, and we thought, well, okay, we're going to do Delphi in the back end and deploy them as Windows services for PLC communications to talk to those real-time controllers um, we had to buy an ActiveX control, which was another popular way of doing things at that time, so we wouldn't have to write our own or roll our own. That's kind of scary to talk about right now, and it's really kind of dated, but um, that was our best option at the time to have our nice dynamic display. Plus, we were comfortable with it. So right about the 2008, we had been doing this for five years, and it was very tiring. Um, we'd bring in new engineers, and even mid-level or senior-level guys had trouble assembling our systems and customizing them because they had to know so many things. I mean, you really had to know Delphi, you had to know HTML to some degree, uh, PHP, JavaScript. So we were tired of that and we thought, well, man, we were thinking about the good old days, VB. All you had to know was one tool to do the back end, to do the front end, and a little bit of SQL to talk to the database because our SQL access is usually pretty straightforward. So we thought, well, what can we do now in 2008 to kind of get back to where we were, you know, with a simpler system? So we started looking at scripting languages again. Uh, we evaluated um, Python and uh, Ruby, um, um, and then of course Rebel. Because and, and Rebel, my history with Rebel is I discovered it in 1999, and it was it was just really amazing to see how little code you could write to to do this, and it. Kind of reminded me a little about my with my start back in the early 1980s, you know, on the old Commodores, and it was really easy to you know to work in BASIC and to, and to do useful things with it, and it seemed like Rebel kind of brought back a little of that fun from you know the early days, and, and there were other more practical considerations too, like how fast Ruby was changing, how fast Python was changing, you know, they were all moving targets, and based on our previous five years or actually eight years, you know, if you include um, VB, we were worried about what the large corporations were going to do to us. Because if you can disenfranchise millions of people with VB, what, what's next? And also at the time, another reason was Delphi. It looked like in a few years that whole product was going to disappear as well. So uh, yeah, after, after that evaluation period, we decided on Rebel. It, um, we did have some issues. Um, Rebel cannot deal with ActiveX controls. So after all those years, I had to fire up VB6 again, and I wrapped an ActiveX DLL around the ActiveX control 
and then Rebel was able to communicate with that DLL. And the other big win, not right away, was the fact that, well, Rebel's cross-platform, and this is the first time we have this opportunity now to move over to Linux. And um, to do that, we had to somehow get away from the ActiveX control, get away say, and do something else for PLC communications. We found uh, an abandoned open source project uh, called Tux EIP. EIP is for Ethernet IP. That's the, uh, the protocol, the Ethernet protocol that it's an industrial protocol for communicating with PLCs and other type of industrial devices. So they had this, it was written in C, and we looked at it and we had to do some bug fixes to it, but we got it running and we compiled a DLL, we compiled a shared object, and you know, suddenly we, we had this, you know, the potential to, to move our systems over to Linux, and, and, and we did. And we deployed systems for about a year, year and a half with uh, the Tux EIP driver. And then we worked later on actually, we became an ODVA member, and we worked on, and ODVA is the organization that controls Ethernet IP. So we became a vendor, and we got manuals like about this thick, and thankfully the CDs along with it. But we studied enough about it to learn how to communicate with our program, programmable controller, and we wrote a native driver in Rebel. And the other thing that we have, in, in addition to that, written in Rebel, are uh, drivers for Modbus, that's, that's another common industrial protocol. Um, also on the Siemens side, because outside the United States, Siemens is the, the, uh, they're the king as far as uh, share, the market share for PLCs. So we have drivers for Siemens S5, Siemens S7, all written in Rebel. So really we're, you know, slowly we're just moving towards pretty much taking control of our own destiny. Um, and, and with now uh, Rebel 3 being open sourced, I mean, that's just another part of that. So our source code, um, we do something that probably doesn't make our competitors too happy, but um, we ship the source code uh, with all of our systems. And it's so easy to do that now because everything from the back end to the front end is a Rebel script. Um, and the nice thing is when our competitors look at it, we're really kind of hiding in plain sight. Our, our feeling right now is that we're pretty safe um, distributing our source code and we really don't care if our competitors get it or not. Um, and, and for the most part, our systems are pretty uh, customized. You know, when we, have, when we do a sort service for, um, you know, a carton that's coming down a conveyor, for example, barcode scanner or RFID scanner uh, reads it and then in near real time we need to be able to get that into our, our Rebel service and look it up in a database, find out what it is and where it needs to go and then within usually less than a hundred milliseconds um, we need to make a, a sort decision about you know do, does it go straight, do we sort it to the right or to the left. So it's, it's a very customized thing and every customer has different business rules for how that works and how they want their packages uh, moved through their facility. So. It's very, uh, we, are, we have templates, and, but every sort service is a little bit different. Um, really, the only intellectual property that we're at all concerned about would be our, our PLC drivers. So I'm going to shift gears here a minute. And, and isn't it always true? The customer looks at your screen and they think that's the whole system. I'm just going to show a few screenshots from uh, a recent project that we deployed late last year uh, for Danon. They're the yogurt people from France. So as you can see, we're using Reb GUI. And in, in 2008, we did start out with vid. Um, we did vid for almost two years, I think. And it, and it did the job well. Vid was actually simpler than this. Um, it didn't look quite as good. We had navigation down the left side of the screen. And the, the biggest thing we ran into with uh, vid was the fact that on different resolution displays, it wouldn't resize automatically. And we would build our screens, which were usually pretty graphics heavy, for a particular resolution for the workstations that we were deploying. And that was fine, no complaints there. But then our customers would try to run them from home over VPN on their laptops. So it didn't fit too well on the screen at that point. So that was our biggest complaint with vid was it just didn't do the auto resizing. And I know we could have extended that and all, but we started looking at the alternatives at the time, and RebGUI was the one that we ended up choosing, um, which has that built in, and also some extra widgets that are nice, like the uh, the tab to browsing, um, which is familiar to everybody. But as you can see right here, we have what we call a top bar, the send blue bar up here, which has some information like the date and who's logged in, 
Um, and, and then those green LEDs with the, uh, you know, like for PLC crane one, crane two, those are just the most important pieces of equipment that we're trying to monitor. So regardless of what screen you're on, you can see if we've lost communications with a, with a particular piece of equipment. Now in this project, the PLC is our PLC, the one that you saw on the slide earlier. Um, these other three things here, they're, uh, for this project, they were three robot palletized or robot cranes that would pick up a, a large pallet of yogurt off of a conveyor and move it into some racking. But this racking is about, it's 10 levels high, about 32 rows deep, and up to 10 deep. And it is a, it's a, a touch screen, so you can see that this is part of Windows right here that you can hit the on-screen keyboard and, and type in something and it'll go into one of the uh, input fields. So now we have a zoom out of the whole HMI and this is pretty typical. What you're seeing on the left here is start, stop, reset, alarm, silence. This is one of the most basic things that an HMI does or a SCADA system does and that's to turn a piece of equipment on or off and to, to monitor its status. Over on the right side, we have a little bit of statistical uh, display. Uh, this system went into West Jordan, Utah, and they had <laughs> some crazy local ordinances that included not overloading racking in a warehouse facility. So what we had to do was, um, our, our system, we have an inventory management module on this particular system in addition to all the other things, and we have to keep track of where all the yogurts at in the racking and what that yogurt is, and um, how much it weighs. So we're basically using, and, and all that's in the MySQL database. So we're basically summing all this up and we're displaying the total uh, number of pounds that's in the rack right now with a total, total allowable rate. So here we've got about 32% about full. Um, in addition to that, it's not just passive recording. We also have to, if we get to certain configurable presets, like I think it's 90%, if we hit 90%, we have to raise an alarm saying the racks are almost full. Um, when it hits 95%, we actually have to physically stop allow, um, uh, pallets from entering the, the, the racking. So much customization in our business. I mean, I've been doing material handling projects for 11 years, and this is the first time we've ever had to worry about rack waiting and, and actually stop um, a customer from putting stuff into the racks. So this is an overview of uh, the pallet conveyor graphics. Uh, this is pretty typical of what we do. It's just very, very simple 2D graphics. Um, you can see over on the right there, um, it's just representing conveyors from an overhead type of view. Um, those little brown squares are actually, they're actually pallets. We, we track using RFID scanners that are placed throughout the system. We're, we're uh, scanning and tracking those pallets in the PLC and displaying them on here. And this is a big part of what SCADA does, it's process visual, visualization. So you can see what's going on in the controller and uh, get information on it. There's the, the real-time controller side, there's the database side. Um, the green means the conveyor is running, the, the legend's over here on the, on the left. Let me see if I can, yeah, we zoom up on it. So that's the uh, color legend for the, um, for the conveyor, running stopped. Uh, E-stop, that's the emergency stop. You know, every uh, industrial system that has moving parts usually has an, an emergency stop. So if something's happening to the product or somebody gets hurt, you can just hit this button, pull on a cord, just like on a bus, and it, it stops immediately. And then we're also showing some other devices on here, such as uh, PhotoWise, which detect the presence or absence of a pallet moving down the conveyor. Uh, solenoid valves, in this case, they're used, and these are pneumatic, air-operated valves. Um, they're used to raise and lower a pallet to change its direction. And then also uh, proximity sensors, which have a job like PhotoWise, but instead of detecting the presence or absence of a, of a light beam, um, a proximity sensor will detect plastic or metal, depending on what type of uh, sensor it is. So one unusual thing about our system that you don't see in a lot of SCADA systems is the fact that you can turn detail on and off. And, and it was very hard to do this with a traditional SCADA system, so that is one of the things, you know, we're using Rebel, and we can do things like this that you can't do with an off-the-shelf package. So um, if you're trying to troubleshoot a problem and you want to see, you know, right now I've got everything turned on, and you can see it's pretty busy. All the devices are displayed the labels uh, for the conveyor designations are displayed and you can turn that off selectively. Now if you were to click on one of those little brown boxes, left single left click with the mouse or with your finger, um, it would show a pop-up and in this case it's giving you information about what that pallet is. The LPN, which is the label on the side of the uh, pallet, 
the RFID tags, uh, the number of cartons that are on the pallet, and then of course the SKU. So you can see what it is, and also if something were to happen, if it were to get jammed or the pallet was damaged in some way and an operator has to physically remove it, um, which happens um, more often than you would think, um, after you've done the physical removal of the pallet and the PLC sees that, hey, there's no pallet there but thinks it's there, you have the opportunity to you know, hit the delete button and it'll remove it from the tracking database. Oh, and by the way, you see we regress to vid here. <laughs> it's, all, it's all vid right there on the pop-ups. Um, but if you were to click on one of the conveyors, you would see a different type of pop-up that would give you information about that conveyor. Um, you have options for putting it in a manual, so if there were some mechanical issue with it, um, a maintenance guy can come over here and put it in a manual and then bump it forward, bump it in reverse, depending on what type of uh, conveyor it is. So right from the screen here, you can, you can see what's going on and you can do maintenance related activities as well, troubleshooting. Uh, just showing this one to give you an idea how we uh, use the data grids in our system, um, and it also shows you how the navigation works. It's um, basically just nested tab displays. So you just so you can kind of easily see where you're at. A lot of the traditional SCADA systems, they you zoom up and they have a back or a forward key, sort of like a web browser, and that's kind of how you navigate. Um, I think this works well here because not only can you see that you're down on the third third level deep in your navigation menu, but you could easily, without using your back arrow, just go right on over to another top level item like control or active alarms. And these are all standard Reb GUI widgets here. In, in some cases, um, we have had some issues with Reb GUI. We've gone in and fixed it ourselves. Um, it's usually something due to resizing. That's been our main problem with Reb GUI is just problems like the, the scroll bars won't snap over to the right size after you've resized the screen. They'll be like right in the middle of the data grid. But what we're looking at here is, is a particular uh, robot crane's command history. So when we track a pallet up to the induct to the crane where we put it into the rack, um, our system uh, or another rebel service would um, send a command to that crane to say, you know, pick up this pallet here and put it over in this rack slot. It's mainly used for troubleshooting purposes. And if you were to double click on that grid, um, on one of the items in that grid, this is the type of information that we're storing there. Uh, in this particular case, it's a get pallet move from the racking. It's a, it's a get pallet from the conveyor into the rack. For crane number two, it's going on the aisle two, the right size, row number 22, uh, level two, and seven deep into the racking. We do reporting. We're slowly improving on it. Typically, we have a couple of reports that we bundle with the system, and then we all, in our quotes, we always give the customer the option to have X number of custom reports. So it's, it's usually changes from job to job. Um, in this case, they were interested in ASRS inventory, and ASRS, I'm sorry, is um, automated storage retrieval system. That's basically the cranes putting pallets into the rack and picking pallets for orders. Because the flip side of this is not just taking pallets from production and then putting them away in the storage. And this is refrigerated storage, by the way. The whole building is refrigerated. It's about 24 degrees or something. It's also picking, so we get orders from their warehouse management system saying, you know, pick these pallets and send them out to the staging lane so they can be loaded onto a truck. So our Rebel service, our inventory management service is um, working on optimizing both the put away and the picking of these orders simultaneously. So you'll have cranes going in, they'll, be, they'll put a pallet away, then they'll pick a pallet. And, and we have different rules for optimizing and, and, and maintaining a certain rate of pallet flow through the system. And if you wonder who wins out on the end, put away always wins because we, there's, they have no floor space to store product coming from production. That, that product has got to go straight into the racking or, or they're in big trouble. So if, if anything gets backed up, we put away before we pick. That's, that's the, uh, the business rule for that. They, they wanted ASRs, uh, a custom ASRs inventory report, um, hospital history, and, and, and basically hospital is um, a certain area that we send pallets to that we've lost tracking on or have some other type of issue. We, we actually have dimensioners too where we um, will actually with um, different photo wire uh, uh, arrangements or a grid will make sure that the pallet is within a certain dimension because we can't put it away into the racking if, it's, if the load is tilted to the side. Um, and these have already been stretch wrapped so that's, that is a, a big concern. So. But, but what you're seeing right here is a typical uh, type of configuration grid. You know, it's usually we've got summary or detailed options. 
Do you want it as a PDF? And we are generating PDF uh, reports using a Rebel, one of the rebel.org libraries, I believe, is where we got it from. And we've modified it. Um, so, so yeah, we, we generate PDF via Rebel and also the very simple CSV, which a customer can take and import into a spreadsheet and, and you know, slice and dice the data any way they like. All right, this is the, uh, the last screen I'm going to show today. This is a visual two-dimensional view of the pallet racking. And you can see that that third row of tabs there, they have, um, this is a 10-level system. Um, at the higher levels, there's actually more rack slots at the, at the lowest level where the staging lanes are shown there. Um, there's no storage there because that's where we're picking all the uh, pallets to, which go onto the trucks. So the, um, the color coding for that, the slot is going to be empty, occupied. Um, we're going to have a pending move which means we've told the crane to do something, but they haven't completed that yet. Um, another thing we do to help optimize our put away uh, for a particular skew is to, when we see a particular skew and we look in the racking, is there a place we can put this, and there's not, no reserve place, then we'll reserve a whole row just for that skew. And, and that way we can keep like things together and that really helps um, optimize the picking. And we also, this thing, satellite present, uh, probably a better term for that is shuttle. The crane picks up a pallet and it puts it into the racking. And if you've seen a lot of warehouses, they're usually only like one or two deep. Um, but this one actually can go much deeper than that. But there's no forks to put, you know, a pallet that deep into the racking. So what they have is this little automated shuttle with the pallet on it, and it actually runs down into the racking autom automatically. Its power is from a capacitor, and they actually have enough energy to move a very heavy pallet of product, you know, 20 feet into a racking and then all the way back again and get back onto that crane. So that's pretty amazing that you can, you can move that load with a capacitor charge, no batteries or anything like that. And as soon as it gets back on the uh, crane, um, it almost, it's like in a, in a couple of seconds it recharges. So it's a, the nice thing about it is a capacitor is you can charge it pretty quickly. So what you're looking at right here then is where you see the little yellow box. That's a pending put. So there's a pallet that's supposed to go there, but it's not made it there yet. The crane has not completed that command. But it's being put there on a reserved row. That's what the red is for. Uh, the gray is empty, and, and the blue is, um, there's pallets already there. So that's how the operators of this system can visualize and see what's in the racking right now. And we have a search box there. You can either type in a slot number or type in a pallet's barcode and it will take you to the right level and put a big X marks the spot where that pallet is. And if it doesn't find it, then it'll tell you it's not there. So um, it, it looks really simple. I mean, graphically, there's nothing really that impressive here. Um, but what it takes to make that box color is, is pretty complicated because we have to get data from multiple sources. And, and, and well, in this case, the, the main source is from the database. And we need to refresh it automatically. And what we found in our testing before we deployed the system was this, we had good performance here. Everything worked great. Um, but then when we got to the field and we started running production and the number of pallets in the system increased because we had tested with only a few hundred pallets. Practically, we had information between nine and 13,000 pallets at any given time. And we purge our pallets table with all that information every 14 days. So we have stuff dropping off the back end, but the average is nine to, yeah, nine to 12, 13,000 pallets. Um, so when you have an HMI, and this is you know, a traditional client, and it's over the network, we were finding that the SQL query to get that information to populate this display was taking about three seconds. So every two seconds, the HMI would freeze for three seconds. So our simple way of implementing this fell completely on its face, and we didn't realize this until we were in the field and, and in production, actually. <laughs> and, oh, and, and part of the reason for this problem, well, part of it's just there was a lot of data that we needed on a regular basis. So we were pulling this data in and putting it in a very large Rebel block. And the way we've implemented this right now, this is a Reb GUI widget that it's a, it's a custom one we created. And, and we've been doing this for a couple of years, but this is where we kind of, this is the straw that kind of broke the camel's back on performance. We gave each of these types of widgets its own timer. So it updates itself. We don't, I mean, we just configure it, you know, in the code. And then it knows what data it needs. It knows how to update itself. Um, but unfortunately, if you do some rough math here, especially on the higher levels where there's more slots, 
we could have up to nearly 700 widgets on a single screen. And that's 700 timers firing every couple of seconds. So we were running into some real performance issues with that as well. Uh, we got around some of the issues by the, the common tricks, like if the data didn't change from the last time you checked, don't update yourself, don't update your face. That was a huge improvement right there. Um, another common trick is we disable all the timers on tabs that aren't being shown. Um, that, that was a big win. Um, and plus, each widget is not doing its own SQL query. That would have been a, a complete disaster. I instead, each widget looks into the big rubble block with all that data, and it's, it's hashed. And so you can, it can just look up a, a, key, you know, a, a key item, and it returns a block. Um, and it gets all the data it needs. And if, if data changed, then it updates itself. So we did all these tricks that we knew how to do. Um, but at the end of the day, the, um, the whole idea of having a timer on every widget is not working for screens with so many graphic objects like it, like it used to. So, so we were, we're, we're actually right now looking at some alternatives of this. And to get back to the three-second problem, where the whole screen was freezing for three seconds, um, what we did to solve that was we put a data collector in the background. So when the HMI starts, it starts another Rebel task. It's a socket server. So the HMI starts this task and then connects to it over a socket. And then it's that data collector's job to go out and get that large amount of pallet data on a periodic basis. And then when that data comes in, it just pushes it over the socket. So it's just an event, just a single event at that time. And that, that actually was a big win. It went from about three seconds for that SQL query uh, down to around 100 milliseconds to push all that data, the same amount of data. And so we, we avoided that problem um, using that method. And, and we're working on it now. We're, it's, we haven't deployed it with a customer yet, but we thought about you know, how can we extend this and get rid of all these timers to where we only really have one timer for, for global periodic type updates. And we thought, well, let's just extend that whole data collector idea first initialize, every widget will initialize itself, and it'll know that that socket's there, and it'll subscribe to data. It says, I want this data over the socket. And then the background data collector, one or more data collectors, whether you're trying to get data from the database or the, the PLC, will pull this data, and when it sees that it's changed, um, it will push that data out to the HMI over the same type of socket I described earlier. And then there'll be that event routine. We'll basically look at it and see, okay, this is data for widget 20. And we would add another uh, refinement or um, uh, function to the uh, widget that would basically be like a um, execute or process data type function. And it would just, we would just pass it that rebel block. And that widget would know what type of data it is expecting and it should see. So that type of a generic mechanism is what we're looking at right now to, to really make this a a, uh, a smooth running and uh, better scalable type uh, HMI. What we're doing here now, this works. We have it at Danon. It works fine. Um, unfortunately, that touch screen I was showing you earlier is a, door, a, a Core 2 Duo, and it's a lower end one at that. So we got stuck with that, uh, unfortunately. Um, but it does work, and the customer is satisfied with it. They signed off on it. Now, this, this same HMI running on an i7, no problem at all. It's, it's nice and snappy. It, it works fine on i7. So our, our current strategy right now is just we, we deploy all of our HMIs on an i7 just in case we have to do screens like this. Um, but we want to we wanna change this architecture so it, it, it's much more scalable than it is right now. And I'll probably ask some of you guys later about that because that was one of the things that we've been brainstorming internally. Um, we think the, the subscribe publish mechanism is a good way to get around this issue. Um, but during our research on that, that's what kind of brought us over to uh, Max's uh, Liquid and his data flow uh, platform or, or library. So we're also investigating that as, a, as another way to do things only when we have to do them. You know, the, the way that, you know, like with the, with the plugs, for example. Wire this all up so that if the data changes, then something is done. Otherwise, we don't do anything. You can see it, it doesn't look that bad, but these are all bitmap fonts. And Rebel 2, you know, out of the box, it's bitmap fonts. You can't use anti-alias fonts unless um, you use draw. It makes a difference. And, and our customers, some of our customers have complained. You know, they still work fine. They just don't look as good as they could. The, the, the main thing that we're, we're looking at for that right now is, well, if, if we're having font issues with Rebel 2 and we've, we've hit, you know, it, it works okay on Windows, but we can't quite get it right on Linux. 
may, maybe it is time to accelerate our strategy of, of you know, eventually moving to Rebel 3 and uh, do it sooner rather than later. Because uh, until about a month or two ago when these graphic issues started kind of bubbling up to the surface, um, our plan was just to stick with R2 for the next three to five years easily. We really had no reason to move. Everything worked fine. We, we understood how it worked, stable, um, like was mentioned earlier in the day as well. But because of these graphics issues, I, I think that we are going to be moving in the short term to, to our Rebel 3. And we're going to start with the HMI, you know, to get, to get the graphics um, right. And then we're going to move our services after that. So it'll probably be an evolutionary process. We may actually even mix deployments for a while. And with that, I, I'd like to make officially, although some of you have already heard this, um, you know, an official announcement. We started talking with uh, Robert last month, and we were entering into kind of an informal working relationship with Safirian. They have Rebel 3 right now. They have a, a build of it. They have it with graphics. It works okay. They even have their own um, commercial product that they're selling. I can't remember the name of it. But uh, what they're focused on right now, they've got the, the Windows okay, but they're focusing on the Android. And we're interested in Android as well because we have a lot of requests from our customers to, to have it on a tablet. So that, that is exciting, but what we need to move forward you know, in our own company is to have it running on Linux as well. I know the core is running on Linux, that's great, but we need the graphics. So um, we're going to be working with Safirian on that over the course of the next uh, six to nine months, I would think. And we, we have uh, one uh, software engineer, Shishin, who's going to be, we're trying to dedicate him about 10 to 15 hours a week working with, uh, with the Safirian folks on that. So we're pretty excited. He's already got a bit of a start on it. He's able to open up a window, show a blue triangle, resize the window. So it, it is a start, but um, we'd like to work with Safirian and, and, and make this happen on Linux before the end of the year. That's our goal. Can't finish without saying, Atronix is hiring. <laughs> if you want to see the, the postings, the current postings we have, just go to monster.com, search for Atronix. I, I, there should be three different postings there right now. They tend to expire. They're very expensive, so we're, they're not always there. But whether it's now or a couple months from now or next year, uh, just don't forget that. And you can also just send your resume to HR Engineering, atronicsengineering.com. So uh, as a company, we should focus more on becoming more involved in the community, especially the Stack Overflow. I just became aware of that recently. I, I kind of heard a little bit about it, but I didn't realize it was such a serious focus on it um, until last night, actually. When I was, we were talking to Fork, so <laughs> I know he's doing a lot of good work in that area trying to promote Rebel, so. And he's going to have a lot more to say about that shortly. Thank you.